Jesus. Father Lord, we know there is power in the name of Jesus to break every chain. Lord, we call upon that power tonight to break every chain of darkness that the God of this world has used to blind the eyes of the world, that they may not understand, nor acknowledge what God has desired to do. The Lord has spoken good concerning this ministry. The Lord has spoken good concerning this family. The Lord has spoken good concerning the mission. Lord, in the good he will show us, we shall show to others. Father, Lord, God of those, we call upon you tonight and we ask you, O Lord, that your authority that supersedes the heaven, that supersedes the sea, that supersedes all dominion and all realm, that it should rest upon his words tonight. Lord, the God of this world has blinded the heart of the unbeliever so that they cannot understand the gospel of Christ. Lord, let every darkness be removed. Because you said in your word, casting down every imagination, every thought, and every ordinance, everything that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Lord, whatever is that power that exalts itself against the knowledge of God tonight, Lord, we cast down that imagination. We bring every thought in the obedience of Christ Jesus our Lord. Holy Spirit, you are the comforter, the love left with us for this purpose, so that you will comfort, guide, direct, and instruct us. So that we can be equipped in every good work. Holy Spirit, we ask for your counsel tonight. Come down in the mighty power. Come down in the mighty glory. For when we know not how to pray as we are, the Spirit Himself help our infirmities. We go on that cannot be altered. When we go on, the Spirit Himself testifies that we are the sons of God. We believe according to the covenant of His promise. Holy Spirit, we are your son and daughter. Tonight, come down in that power. Make your word know. Open the revelation of your word into our heart. And open our mouth to speak your word with boldness and without fear or respect of person. That in everything, only your name will take place. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. <coughs> Amen. In Jesus' name, we pray. <coughs> Brethren, tonight we are. Come to the presence of God again. Amen. Just to exalt his name and to thank him for all he has done and all his benefits in the new year. This is another Sunday where we open the Bible. It's five o'clock in Sweden. So in Nigeria it should be about six o'clock. This is the opportunity we use to teach about the scripture, to understand prophecy. The Bible prophecy. Today we are focusing on the seal. <clears throat> Understanding the seal. How do we understand the seal? What is the seal? And why do we need to understand it before we can go into the book of Revelation to exploit the remaining of the prophecy? The book of Revelation is a book of prophecy. And this prophecy of the kingdom, the Bible said, he will be preached to all nations as a testimony again and before the end can come. Jesus told us something about Matthew 24, about the sign of his coming. That's why this seal becomes very important. All that Jesus told us about Matthew are explained in this seal. But today we are going to be looking at the background, what we need to know before we can understand prophecy. How is this prophecy understood? How was it interpreted? How sure are we that when we interpret it in our local church, we are right, that we are not just preaching heresies? That we're not teaching the word of God in a way that people will not be content with. That the word of God we are teaching from our mouths came from the lips of God. And that the Bible itself confirms it. This is the reason why today teaching is very important. Why we have a whole book of seal ahead of us by next week to teach. But this week we are taking opportunity to explain the patterns in prophecy. The seal. Why is it that when God speaks, he decides to give it a break and allow some times like coffee break? And we will start it from the beginning of all the Bible before we can branch into other teachings. In Genesis, when God created the heaven and earth, and after he created heaven and earth for five days, on the sixth day, before God decided to rest on the seventh day, he set 
to the angels. There was a meeting, a kind of conference meeting. He said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. What you call that is like a break of discussion. We evaluate the work we've done so far. It was good and very good. In fact, it was perfect. But now, we are about to go for the seventh day, the day of our final rest. But before we rest, we have to assess all our labor. And that's one thing was left to be created, man. And God decided, before he creates man, let's make him in our image, after what our likeness. And behold, let him have dominion. Remember when he was creating the beast of the forest, the beast of the air, and the beast of the sea? He never said, let us. He commanded and they came forth. But when he come to the ultimate creator, the purpose why all those things were created, the reason why the earth existed in the first place, he said, let us. Let's settle that. Let's make man in our image after our likeness. Why am I explaining this? Because this also will help you to explain the book of Revelation. Then you understand that there is always a break between the sixth and seventh. That in the scriptural prophecy, one to three to seven is not spontaneous. After six, there is an interval, a gap. And this gap is unexplained time in the scripture. Because, for example, when we just says before God, oh, seven days, we always assume that this gap between the six and the seven days is just maybe one hour or one day. Or 24 hours. No. In the scripture, the gap between the six and the seven days are higher than what we think. If we go through the scripture, these things are not isolated incidents in Genesis. They are throughout the entire scripture. There is a gap between six and seven. And if you go to the book of Daniel chapter 26, you understand that even Daniel has a gap in his prophecy between in Daniel chapter in Daniel chapter 9 let's go to Daniel chapter 9 and see what we are explaining in this particular prophecy Daniel chapter 9 verse 26 in Daniel chapter 9 verse 26 it said and after three score and two weeks after three score and two weeks, which is, remember the prophecy was about 70 weeks of prophecy. Then, when he said after three score and two weeks, he's talking about after seven, three score and two weeks. You understand? Which is 69 weeks. After 69 weeks, but one week is remaining. Why would God deliberately leave that out of 70 weeks constant? Consistent prophecy. The seventieth week was deliberately left behind, and he said after three score and two weeks, a gap. And this gap, what happened in this gap? This will help you to foretell the distance between that interval. That it was not seventy weeks; it was more than seventy weeks. He said after three score and two weeks, Messiah. Messiah shall be cut off. Messiah shall be cut off. That's what happened before, after three score and two weeks, but before the 70th weeks. In verse 26, I read it here. He said, After three score and two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. That is the death of Christ. That is Daniel in the Old Testament, more than 2,000 years before Christ was ever born on earth, telling you that after three score and two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. But what he was foretelling in prophecy was about 490 years of this. And within that 490 years typography, he made it clear that after three score and two weeks, Messiah shall be cut off. Brethren, good evening, or welcome. So before we continue this teaching, I would like to introduce myself. Today I will be your host. My name is Missionary Collins. Today we are looking into understanding the seal. So before we understand the seal, it's necessary we understand the pattern of which the seal was structured. 
and while the book of prophecy, you may search Google, search all through the internet, you will find more than 150 explanations, and about 150 of them are probably wrong. Because it is not because they don't study, it's because they fail to understand that the interpretation of the scripture is in the scripture itself. You don't need some strange or cutting book or any material books to interpret the scripture. The scripture interpretation is itself in the scripture. The law will not reveal a mystery to you and hide the interpretation away. They are all in his word. And there is nothing that happened in the scripture that has not preluded or something similar has happened before in the past. And God is using that as a typography to show you things that will happen in the future. Even in our school of prophecy, we also teach prophetics to understand that God does not just reveal straight ahead vision that in the next 20 years this will happen. No. Before he shows you what will happen in 20 years, he will show you things that will happen that same day. That will be a preamble for you to understand that what he spoke about in the future will surely come to pass. So God does not go consistently in prophecy. In prophecy is a typography that this thing happened this year, but something greater and similar will happen again in the future. That's how prophecy are explained. And that's how this particular book explains prophecy. Remember, in the book of Isaiah, he said, Unto you a son is born, unto you a son is given, and the government of the earth shall be upon his shoulder. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Prince of Peace, and a Mighty God. And a Mighty God. But let's ask yourself, some people will tell you, this prophecy has been fulfilled when Christ was born. When Christ was born, he was a lamb. He was not a mighty prince. He was not king of kings. He was not the governor of the earth was not upon his shoulder. In fact, they killed him. They took him to the cross and they crucified him. And he was not a mighty God because the Jews never even accepted him as the Christ. But the coming Messiah will be. The world and the Jewish people will accept him as the Messiah. And that's why I like the book by Dave Anderson, the coming Christ. He emphasized most of these things in his writing, and even the date and the structures of all this writing. And he makes you understand that, behold, this Christ we're talking about it has two formats. The first, he was the lamb that was slain to redeem us from the sin we all committed in Adam. Now, he is coming the second time, not longer as a lamb, but as a lion of the tribe of Judah. And that is when the governor of this earth will be upon his shoulder. That's why Psalm 2, the fulfill that says, Why does the king write, and the rulers of the earth take counsel against them? And the Most High says to him, Ask of me, I will give you this city to be your inheritance. And the utmost part of the earth will be for you a possession. You will have power to break it with a rod of iron and to dash it to pieces as the potter dashes his vessel. So this is exactly when that prophecy will be fulfilled. But that is exactly what we are explaining here. So for you to understand it, the explanation in the book of Revelation, you have to understand your Bible from Genesis to Revelation. Many pastors are finding it difficult to be able to get grasp of it, not because they are not skilled in the world, but because most of them are finding it difficult to understand their Genesis study. Because the revelation cannot be understood except you understand your Genesis study and the judges, then you understand the king's man redeemers, the loss of Levite marriage, the king's man redeemers. So when you understand those things, then you cannot dive in to understand what the book of Revelation is actually talking about and understand the interpretation thereof. So the interpretation of the book of Revelation are quite simple. And this book's interpretation was not given to me because of the wisdom I have above any other person. But so that you may understand and use it for your prophetic teaching and to be able to save life in this end time. Because a lot of hot things are going to be going on in the world from now to the end of the world. But you need the word of God to be able to save life and to be able to drag people out of captivity. And that is the purpose why this gospel becomes very important. This teaching 
is not going to be too technical. We are going to try our best to make it as simple as possible so that every member of Christ will understand the book of Revelation, will be able to decode it for himself and be able to interpret it and use it for his Sunday teaching, just like the way he would use the book of Matthew to teach every Sunday. So that is exactly the plan and the purpose of this lecture. And we pray that the Holy Spirit help us and guide us to be able to interpret it in a way that you will understand and be able to use it for your day-to-day -day service. Brethren, this 70 weeks was determined concerning the people. If you read from verse 24, it says 70 in the book of Daniel chapter 9. It says 70 weeks were determined upon thy people. 70 weeks. And what are they going to achieve in 70 weeks? And upon the holy city, not only upon the people of Israel, and upon Jerusalem, the holy city, and to finish what? All their transgression. Two. To make an end to sin and to make reconciliation for iniquity. Just imagine, in just 70 weeks, let's read it in Amplified. Let's see what Amplified says about that 24. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24. And it said, 70 weeks are determined upon that people and upon that holy city to finish transgression, to make an end to sin, and to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy, to anoint the most holy place. Every other one you might try to understand. But this last one, anoint the most holy place. Where is the most holy place? Some of us might ask. In Hebrew, the most holy place is known as the holiest of all, which is Kadeshin Kadeshina in Hebrew, where the high priests have access to be asked beyond the mercy seat. It's known as the holiest of all. And that is the place where the high prince can only assess the mercy seat once in a year after a festival preparation known as New Kapo. So this is the place that is the most holy place. And the second thing is seal of vision and prophecy. But today we still have vision and prophecy. That means vision and prophecy has not been sealed. So somebody will ask, in 490 years to achieve all this vision, 490 years, which is, why is it 490 years? I remember we read 70 weeks, 70 times 7. Because 70 weeks of seven. So when the Jews say 70 weeks of years, they are actually determining, just like we use in English, decade. So 70 weeks of years, which is 70 and seven, which is 490 times. And these things are not figure of speech. Jesus, remember when the apostle came to Jesus and asked Jesus Christ, how many times should my brother offend me? And I will forgive you. Remember what he told them? He said seven times. He said no. Seventy times seven. Four hundred and ninety times. That is the number of years God forgave the children of Israel. So that is the number of time your brother will offend you and you will forgive him. For four hundred and ninety years. And that is exactly what this prophecy symbolizes. And also make it clearer to us to seal up visions and prophecy, to bring in everlasting righteousness. I don't think so. We don't have everlasting righteousness yet. But the Bible told us that 70 weeks are determined for all this to take place. 70 weeks of years, 490 years to accomplish all this vision. Now, in our preferred, 70 weeks of years or 490 years and decree upon your people and upon the holy city Jerusalem to finish and to put an end to transgression, to seal up and to make full measure of sin, to purge away and make expatiation and reconciliation for sin, to bring in everlasting righteousness, permanent moral and spiritual restitute in every area and relation 
to seal up vision and prophecy and prophet to anoint the holies of holies or in Hebrew the holiest of all. So this is what seventh year was set to achieve. But how was it? Was he ever commanded? Remember, Gabriel also gave the timeline unto Daniel and he said, Therefore, and understand, fought from the commandment to build and to restore Jerusalem unto Messiah the Prince shall be seven weeks and three score and two, and the streets shall be built again. And even and the war, even in troublous time. Take us back to the scripture in the book of Nehemiah. When Nehemiah was trying to build the temple, in the Sabila and Toby, they rose up against him, and they sought to slay him in the midst of the work. So to the extent Nehemiah ordered the people to have a sword and a shed while they are building the wall to prepare for battle. And the war was built in trouble time. And according to the time appointed to him by the king of Babylon, then to the king of Persia then to go and build the temple. And this timeline was accomplished. And the war was built again. And the bridges were set and were fixed on board. That was the building. But this many Christians tend to confuse this place with the building of the temple in Jerusalem, which was Zerubbabel. Where they were trying to build the temple, they could not because they have no security. And the wall, they were having some serious problem building the temple because the people were attacking them from all sides. So that is what happened in the building of the temple. But if you check the timeline, Michael was perfectly right. The decree of Lajabanas was exactly that AD at which time Gabriel said 70 weeks were the time, which was the 69 weeks. And he made it clearer that the time to rebuild the temple, Timezar the priest, there shall be three, four, and school weeks. So these times was 70 weeks was accomplished from that decree. To the time that Jesus made his triumphant entry into Jerusalem. Because throughout his lifestyle, they wanted to make him king. He rejected the offer. But a certain days in history, during the triumphal entry, he sent a disciple to get an axe. And he sat on it. And they spread leaves and garments on the feet. And he walked on it. And what did he say? Behold, thy king comes. They were seeking Zechariah 9.9. And what of Zechariah 9 9 said? Let's read Zechariah 9 9. Zechariah 9 9. Zechariah 9 9 said, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. O shout, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, thy king cometh unto thee. Is just and having salvation, lowly and riding upon an ass and upon the coat, the foe of an ass, just as they did according to the prophecy of Daniel. And they were also quoting Psalm 119, which says, Behold, thy king cometh. Thy king. It was a specific statement, thy king cometh. Which is a fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Behold, thy king cometh. He is on an axe, the foe of a coat. And the children were singing, Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. And that statement angered the high priest. But what were they happy? The children were singing a song. But singing that song under that constant condition, they were proclaiming him the Christ, the Messiah. That means the high priest know the implication of the song. And that's why they told the people to stop singing. Because proclaiming him the Christ means that the high priest is supposed to know that he was the Christ on shape. And in the triumphant entry, Jesus did another funny thing. He looked over the city and he wept. Why would he wept over a city? Or he said, triumphant entry day, a day of joy that his enemy has subject to him. But he wept 
And he said, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, how long would I have loved to gather thee? As the hen gather his chicks, but you will not. But therefore, your house is left unto you desolate. Now let's go back to our book of Daniel. The book of Daniel, chapter 9, from verse 26. Daniel 9, verse 26. What did he say? He says to us in Daniel 9, verse 26. He says, And after three score and two weeks, after three score and two weeks of years, shall the anointed one be cut off or killed, and shall be an nothing, and no one belonging to the land and defending him. And the people of the other priest and other priest. Let's get it right. The people of the other priest. Who are the people of the other priest? We will find out from the writer. He said, The people of the other priest who shall come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. But we know who destroyed Jerusalem in 70 AD. The Roman on that Titus besieged the city and destroyed Jerusalem and the temple both. 32 years into the interval. But how come that we are not yet in the 90th weeks? 490 years was consistent. 483 years was consistent. But the last seven years never came to pass. Why? Because the gap of the interval is so long that we did not know how long and so fast as we have counted that it has been more than 2,000 years and it may come to a close any moment and the seventh days which is the last seven days documented in history is known as the seven years of the great tribulation so that is the part we are about to explain in the book of revelation and that is the part i will be going to any moment from now now, let's read verse 27, then we'll bring Daniel to a close and go back to our study. Verse 27 says, He shall confound a covenant with many for one week. That is the 70th year. And that 70th year happened after the interval of 32 is taken from it. Messiah was killed inside it. The church was not Noted in the Old Testament, the church age started, and now we are almost at the close of the church age. The interval has not come to an end. And we knew from the prophecy of John that the church age has an end. And when it ends, this seventh week will surely come to pass during the three and a half years of the Antichrist and the other three and a half years of the Antichrist rising to power. And that is exactly what we are looking into in this 70th week. And the Bible said in the 70th week he will confirm a covenant with men. He shall enter into a strong and a firm covenant with many for one week, which is seven years. And in the midst of the week he shall cause the sacrifice and offering to cease for the remaining three and a half years. And upon the wings of the tabernacle of abomination shall come one who makes desolate until the fool determined and is poured out on the desolator. So that is what we are about to study. The last one week of the earth. And what happened in this last one week of the earth that makes it so important for the Christian dog? We are about to see. We're going to be starting with the opening of the seal. Why is understanding the seal so important for Christendom? Because the seal explains Matthew chapter 24. Jesus' message to the disciple about his return. And that's why we Christians, if we want to understand the Lord's return, we also have to understand what the seal stands for. There was one example of the angels today. Angels are golden hair beauties who save us from courage. It is a very, it is in, this is even a magazine, Angel on Earth, 
that is devoted to printing reader experience to encounter with engine. It has circulated in the hundreds of thousands. But the first AD, it was not so. Because there is a curious fact that the New Testament Apostle Paul never speaks of angels in that expanse. Because he knew that there were two classes of angels in the New Testament. We have the angels that minister to God means in heaven, like the one that heralded the birth of Christ, Gabriel, and like the angel who fought on behalf of the people in the case of Daniel, Michael. We have all these angels, but we also have one big guy that got himself into trouble, Lucifer. And we have other angels renewed from the book of Daniel and Ezekiel and even Isaiah and the book of Revelation that two thirds of the stars fell with him. That means two thirds of the host of heaven were brought down when Lucifer fell. Lucifer's fall did not just happen. <coughs> when he was crashing to the earth, he brought down to ten of the angels. And those angels were reserved on that chain. God did not allow them to roam free upon the earth. And the angels of earth. But in what it is said in the book of Romans chapter 8 from verse 38 to 39, he said, For I am persuaded that Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor power, nor things present, nor things to come, shall be able to separate me or separate us from the love of God. So why would Paul say this? Because he knew that there are good angels, there are also terrible ones. For I think that God has set forth us as us, the apostle last, as it were appointed to death, we are made a spectacle unto the world, and to angels, and to men. So, in both example, the angels, not all of them are friends to humanity, but some of them are. Why is it necessary for us to understand? That not all angels are friends to humanity. So that before you start jumping at any shining lights that have feathers that jump into your room because it might just be one of the principalities. Because principalities, remember what the Bible says that even the devil can be transformed into an angel of light in order to deceive. To understand the implication of these facts, it might be the best to begin with a cosmological worldview that was current in the first century CE, based on the seven planets known at that time. The moon was known, Mercury was known, Venus was known, the sun, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn were known. Even to the extent they erected an idol to the god Jupiter, to the hill of Mars and Saturn. So the ancient knew all this thing, even most of your scientific knowledge you now call physics or geography came from the ancient who named all these planets, even before microscopes were invested. They were believed to evolve around the Earth because none of them has traveled to space to actually know that there was a body called Sun and that they revolve around the Sun. And each on his own crystalline sphere. Beyond this was a realm of fish stars, and beyond that, God Himself, which they were mistaken. In the English world, the heavens has two meaning. One having to do with the physical sky, which is the penura from heaven, from heaven, and the other having to do with the spiritual realm the ancient Greek word called Oralos and had a similar dual sense, the heaven above including the sphere of planets and which regard both the physical sphere and the spiritual dimension. So, why is this study important as we go into understanding 
the sun, the seal. The reason why it's important is because believers are going to be heaven watchers. They are not going to be part of the tribulation, but they're going to see the tribulation from the spiritual dimension. Why there will be those who are on that, who are the earth dwellers, who will witness the tribulation face to face. And many of them may not live to tell the story. But the heavenly watcher will be able to see from the beginning of the tribulation to the end without partaking in the tribulation itself. That is the spiritual dimension. It is difficult for us today to understand this worldview. Although we think of heaven in spiritual sense as being up there, we understand it as a metaphor only. The realm of the physical planet and the stars in the outer space to our mind have no spiritual components. But this is not always true. The New Testament also talks that these planetary spheres we are ruled by corrupt forces. Yes, remember Daniel's prayer. It was withheld by the prince of Persia, the angel that was sent from God. Remember, the angels were not sent from the grave. The angel was sent from heaven, from above. And it was coming and was withheld in the air by the prince of the kingdom of Persia. And he withheld him for 21 days. It was after constant prayer and intercession by Daniel that the Lord sent Gabriel to liberate the angel. Why are we saying that? We should know that the high places of the earth are full of corrupt forces. <coughs> because most of us are waiting to see aliens. Oh, does alien exist? Is there life after space? You may be wonder what you will find. Because we understood from the scripture that the forces that live up there they are not very nice to human beings. And they are corrupt forces. So, most of them may not be visible to naked eye. So, no matter how many days you journey through the space, you may not see any one of them, even though they exist around you. And has risen in power. But it goes to this thought. It says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against power, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in heavenly places. There are spiritual wickedness that lives in heavenly places. Ephesians 6 verse 12 told us about this. The word heavenly in King James Version appears in a note. But it's closer to the Greek Eponaros which than it is written in the main text high places. The verse makes it clear that the principalities and power we are not the Roman Emperor, but spiritual forces of evil that exhibit and dwells in the heavenly places. <coughs> in fact, the higher they go, the more wicked they become. Paul himself in Romans chapter 8, verse 38 to 39, uses more and less identical terms in the same way. Let's go ahead to 500 years to the single most important Christian work of in geology, the celestial hierarchy of Denotius and the Aropagites. He listed orders of chalk of angel, each class having a different name. Two of these are the principalities of power. The Sodo Denotius system has taken up by the Dantes in his divine comedy and among others. Notice the change here. For Paul and the author of Ephesians, written in the first century, the principalities and power are among the forces of wickedness in heavenly places. For single donations written in 500 years later, they are honorable members of heavenly hierarchy. No, they are not. They are the forces of wickedness in heavenly places. And it will be an intricate task to show them show when and how this change came about for our purpose. It's enough to know that it did not come about. Thus, the mainstream Christian view of angels are unilaterally benevolent simply does not go back to the earliest time of the faith. Because we knew that beyond the angels of God 
are in heaven ministry to his name. They can only be sent on an appointment. They don't roam about the universe looking for who to save or to free. But principalities, on the other hand, have been cast down. So they are free to roam about the universe and to do all sorts of damages to mankind. And wickedness and cruelty is in their hearts. In fact, among the early Christians, at the rate among one who wrote the New Testament, there are widespread belief that the celestial realms were occupied by evil forces. The struggle of Christians was rise was to rise above them in order to contend with them and possibly defeat them. This scene appeared throughout the New Testament. In Luke 10, verse 18, we find mystifying this. It appeared in this context. Jesus sends out 70 disciples to preach his message. They return with joy, saying, Lord, even the devil were subject unto us through thy name. And Jesus replied, We heard Satan. Satan has likely fall from heaven. So, make it close to you that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. He does not dwell in the ocean as many people predict. Neither does he stay under the earth. A similar idea appeared in John chapter 12, verse 31. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. The prince of this world. The opening of the seal in the document of call in Revelation chapter 5 to 8 and mark the second coming of Christ and the beginning of the apocalypse or the book of Revelation. And upon the land of God, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the opening of the seal on the uncover of the book of the scroll, and the judgment released on the apocalyptic events. Remember, the seal was sealed in seven seals. The whole seal cannot be available to you when you open only one marking. It was sealed in, in, in form of a typhoon. A typhoon is a kind of paper document used in the early 70s AD. So when it's sealed, when you break one seal, you can only see half of what is written in the document as the seal allows you. Then when you break the second seal, it's like a page is torn open. So each page is sealed. So when you open the first, you break the first seal, you can only open one page of the row. But when you break the second seal, you can only open the second part of the row. When you break the whole seal, which is the seventh seal, the whole scroll is available to you, so you can see the beginning of the scroll to the end, which are the mystery. But we understand that the seal was sealed both sides, front and back. So we understand that it was sealed with seven seal, and each of the seal has a content in the scroll. And but one thing that God also respects is. Biblical instinct, because the Bible told us in theology that the Holy Spirit tends to use idioms consistently from Genesis to Revelation. It's known as the law of exposition constancy. So these idioms were also consistent. The same interval that exists in Daniel chapter 9 also exists in this revelation. So the seal started with the first, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth seal. Then there is a break. God does something else. So we don't know how long the interval lasts in the book, in the case of the book of Revelation. But we know that there was an interval. And that interval clearly explained to us why God allows some certain things to happen so that his name can be glorified. And that's what, in another interpretation of the Christian faith, is known as the duration of God's mercy. The interval stands for the duration of God's mercy. In the life of a believer. So God's punishment will not be executed speedily. And that is why the Bible said, because the wickedness upon the wicked is not executed speedily, the wicked sow themselves to do evil. So the reason why the wicked man wants to do more evil, because his punishment does not come as soon as he sin. So he thinks that God will not hear. The most high will not notice my evil deed. I can continue to do more evil as long as God is not going to punish me speedily. 
So, but the faith to understand that though a wicked live for 120 years, the wicked will not go unpunished. And he says, though harm passes harm, the wicked will not go unpunished. And that is God for you. He said, it may not be today, it may not be tomorrow, but I will punish him. So the wicked never goes unpunished. He might be committing sin for 100 years, for 50 years, but he will punish it. So, that is why as a Christian, why would God wait for such a long time to punish the wicked? Because he's a God full of mercy. He does not delight in the death of the wicked. But his will is that they should come to repentance. The long duration of God's mercy is for the wicked to repent. That's why you see a, weak, a righteous man will live for 50 years and God calls him home. But the wicked will live for 120 years. But God will keep showing his mercy. Because it is not his will for any wicked to die and perish. But his will is that they should come to repentance. And that is the duration of God's mercy. That's why the righteous are taken out of the earth. And the wicked are placed. Remember what the book of Habakkuk told us. He said when we see that the just are taken out of the earth, they don't know that the just are taken out so that the wicked can return. When the just are taken out, the wicked will reign. So the righteous are not taken out for the righteous to come. They are taken out for the wicked to come. And the reason why the wicked are left, God still shows his mercy. Hoping that one of those wicked that are left after the righteous may one day look upon their situation and return to God. And God may save their soul. Because it is not his wish that any of us should perish at any time. But most of them did not change. They did not repent of their idol worship. They did not return of their sexual immorality. They did not return for worshiping devils. But until they were destroyed. So this judgment of God was not done in anger. It was done in mercy. Revelation chapter 5 verse 6. Revelation chapter 5 to 6 is our test for today. But we would go further to verse chapter 7. To open the seal of the book of Revelation. What does the seven seal represent in Revelation? The opening of the seven seals begin Revelation chapter 6, verse 12, and continue through chapter 7. The doctrine covers seven, 77 to 6 in the book of Isaiah, teaching us that the seven seals symbolizes years of God history unfold. The mystery of the end. Many historians believe it covers 1,000 year history. But personally, I believe it symbolizes the preparation of the judgment of the saint. Because the fact that the saint was already taken to heaven before the seal was opened shows that it's the presentation of the end time before our eyes. Retrospects and a reply. Take heed that no man deceive you. That was what Jesus told the disciples when they came to him on the Holy Discourse. Take heed that no man deceive you. What does that symbolize to us? It means that this end time there is going to be a lot of deceiving going on. You will receive deception from the government. You will receive deception from the church. You will receive deception even from the people you trust, from your family members, from friends, from false prophets. The Lord said you should take heed that no man deceive you. So such were the first word that our Lord replies on his inquiry. What shall be the sign of thy coming and at the end of the age? And the warning is needed still. It is not for you to know the time or season and almost this last utterance of the earth. Remember what Jesus said to the disciples when they want to know the time and season. He made it clear to them it's not for them to know the time and season that the Father has put to fulfill His will. God will do things in His own time. So don't bother to know about the time and season. It was almost His last utterance at the earth before He was taken up. For, and if this knowledge was denied by the Holy was denied to His holy apostles and the prophets, we may be sure it, is, it was not being disclosed to us today. So anybody that told you, I know when the Lord is coming, he is a hypocrite and is lying to his congregation. For no man knows the time nor the hour 
The Lord Jesus said, not even when he was on earth did he know the time. Not even to talk of the angels in heaven. Nobody knew the date. So if you have one angel come to you in a dream to tell you the Lord is coming tomorrow, he doesn't know the time. No can a secret which, remember for the seal to be open, the reason why the seal was sealed, that he sought no man on earth was qualified. No man in heaven, no man under the earth was qualified to break the seal. Except the lion of the tribe of Judah, the conqueror root of David. So it is not possible for the angel to know what they cannot know. As the Lord declared, the Father has in his own power, in Acts chapter 1 verse 7, be discovered by ast astronomical research or flight of higher mathematics. But on the other hand, no thoughtful Christian can ignore the sign and the potent which mark the day we live in. A little thought as a pen that introduced the chapters of this book that the advance and the infidelity would be such terrible rapid strike. In the few brief years that have elapsed in the growth of skepticism with the church has seeded even the groomest forecast and side of the coming prince test by Sir Robert Anderson. The spread of spirituality, demonic worship, has even been appalling. The road tree and reckon by tens of thousands, and in America it has already been systematized into religion, with a recognized creed and cult. But these dark features of our time, striking solemn through the through, through solemn through they be and are not the most significant. Why do not against apostasy of the last day? Thoughts seems to be drawing near. We are gladdened by this signal triumph of the cross. It is not merely that at home and abroad of the gospel is being preached by such multitudes with a freedom never known before, but that in a way unprecedented since the days of the apostle, the Jews are coming to the faith of Christ. The fact is but little known that during the last few years, more than a quarter of a million copies of the New Testament in Hebrew have been circulated among the Jews in the Eastern Europe. And the result has been their conversion to Christianity, not by one or two, as in the past, but in large and increasing number. Entire community in some places have, through reading the Word of God, accepted and despised Nazareth as the true Messiah. This is holy with parallel saints in Pentecostal time. Then again, the return of Jews to Palestine is one of the strangest parts of this day. The second country, the world, that does not offer more attraction to the settler, but be he agriculturist or trader, and yet since the coming of Prince was written, more Jews have migrated to the land of their father and returned in Israel with the decree of Cyrus brought the servitude to a close. But yesterday, the prophecy of Jerusalem should be inhabited as a town without war seems to be long to the future far remote. The houses beyond the gates were few in number. No one ventured abroad after nightfall. Today, the existence of a large growing Jewish town Outside the world is a fact within the knowledge of every tourist. Years by years, the migration and the beauty still go on. If I venture to touch upon the international politics of Europe, it will be but briefly. In consensual with the prophecies of the 70th chapter of Daniel, I have given 
the details, my reason for suggestion that the historical interpretation of the vision does not exhaust its meaning. I, I know to deepen conviction that every part of it awaits its fulfillment. There as elsewhere in the scripture, the great sea must surely means the Mediterranean, and the terrible struggle of supremacy in the Levant appeared to the burdens of the earlier portion of the vision. This nearness of such struggles are now being ushered towards the capital in Europe, and nowhere and the answers than here at all. Never indeed since the days of peace has there been such cause of natural anxiety. The questions of balance of powers in the Mediterranean has recently gained prominence and interest greater and more acute than before it attached to it. I will not notice the topic of more doubtful character defined by myself. Then, now I will attempt to deviate a little. Let's go back to the book of Revelation to read what happened in Revelation chapter 5. Revelation chapter 5, I read from verse 1. Revelation chapter 5 from verse 1. He says, And I saw at the right hand of him that sat upon the throne, at the right hand of him that sat upon the throne, a book written beside and behind. Why? Why is the book in Revelation so significant? Daniel chapter 9 verse 27 also make it clear to us that the disposed figment that was Messiah who made a seven years covenant with the Jewish and causing sacrifice to cease is not the indent of the one week but a violation of the treaty. So what does the one week symbolize? That is what we are about to explain. I saw on the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Remember in chapter 4, we explained the man that sat upon the throne. We knew that he was God. His face was not represented. Neither was his form represented. But we knew that he was a mystery of light. And we also know that he was the father of light. And on the back side, sealed with seven seals. And I saw lying on, on the open hand of him who was seated on the throne, a scroll book written within and on the back side, closed and sealed with seven seal. Closed and sealed with seven seal. That means judgment of God is sealed. In the ancient time, we use seal to prevent people from seeing into our documents or pathos. So seal is very important through the ancient time. And in this case also, this seal was used to prevent people from assessing God's judgment before the accurate time. The judgment has been written. The only way we can assess this judgment is if God desires to reveal it. And the only reason why we even think about the book of Revelation is because Jesus qualified to break the seal. He, he, for you to be able to assess the seal, you have to be first and foremost be worthy to open the seal and to look into it and to read every portion of it. So Christ qualified. That was why the revelation was given to him. So that's why when we call it by the book of Revelation, we call it the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave to him. It's not the revelation of John. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. God gave it to him. John only writes it as a signet. Jesus signified it to John. He as he revealed it to John. This is the revelation God gave to me about the end of the world. How it's going to look. John, I am 
giving you a picture format of it so that you can use it to save the world right now. That's why when you come to some place in the book of Revelation, John were told to seal up some certain things and he should not make it known until the end because Jesus owned the revelation. Not all mysteries John were allowed to reveal to us. So in the book of Revelation chapter 5 verse 2, I saw a strong angel, a strong angel, proclaiming with a loud voice, who is worthy to open the book and to lose the seal thereof. And I saw a strong angel, and I saying in a loud voice, who is worthy to open the scroll, and who is entitled or deserve and is morally fit to break its seal. So, remember, for you to break this seal, you have to be one, entitled, two, you have to be qualified, and three, you have to be morally fit to break this seal. But the search was done everywhere. The search was done in heaven. The search was done on earth. The search was done in the sea. To see if there was any man on earth that qualified to break the seal or to read from it. He said in verse 3, no man in heaven nor on earth nor neither under the earth was able to open the book, neither to look thereon. So, remember what Jesus told us when he was on earth. He said, For the day and the hour know not any man. One, no man on earth or in heaven or under the earth was able to look into it. They were not able to look into it or even to read of it. And I, John Webbs, the mystery of God that I wanted to get my hand on about the second coming of the Lord, where all our doubts will be solved, I cannot get access to it. So none of us on earth were morally fit to open it. None of us has prevailed in the eyes of God. All our righteousness we are in rack. Despite all our claims of glory and powers, we could not transcend the gate of heaven to break the soul and to lose the seal thereof. <laughs> there was no man worthy on earth in the whole of the universe. There was none worthy under the earth in the oceans. There was none worthy in heaven except the Father and Christ himself. None was worthy. But I, I wept much. I wept audibly <coughs> and bitterly. Why? <coughs> because no one was found fit to open the scroll. That was why I was weeping. And to inspect it. Hmm. But one of the elders said to me, <coughs> Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah and the root of David has prevailed to open the book. The lion, but we're in the spiritual sphere. What have Judah got to do with heaven? What have the roots of David got to do with heaven? I thought David was a king in Israel. But there was one man found. Though the angel said, Who is worthy? Nobody was worthy. But somebody was found on earth of the root of David. The conqueror of David. Though he was the root, he was also the offspring of David. Though he was the offspring of David, he brought David to existence. He is the root and the offspring of David. And he is the lion from the tribe of Judah, which in our times he was the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. Hmm. He has prevailed. What a wonderful day. He prevailed to open the book and to lose the seven seal thereof. One of the elders in heaven, of the heavenly Sir Andrew, said unto me, Stop weeping. 
Stop keeping the lion of the tribe of Judah. The root source of David has won. I has overcome and have conquered. He has he can open the scroll and break its seal, its seven seal. Verse 6 told us the head, no. In the midst of the throne, the four living creatures, and the midst of the elders, and in the midst of the elders stood a lamb as it was slain. Remember where the word, the lamb, came from. Jesus Christ. And having seven heads, seven horns, and seven eyes, and which are the seven spirits of God, sent forth into all the earth. Seven spirits of God. Christ was the carrier of the Holy Spirit of God. No wonder he said, if I do not go, the comforter cannot come. But if I go away, the comforter, I will send the comforter. Because if Christ does not depart, he was the carrier of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit will not come. So for him, for the Holy Spirit to come, that Christ must have to depart. And he said to them, it was a benefit to them that he goes away. Because if he does not go, the Holy Spirit cannot come down. And he here was a carrier of the Spirit of God. Then, and there between the throne and the four living creature of beings, among the elders of the heavenly Sahendra, and I saw a lamb standing, as though he has been slain, with seven horns and seven eyes, which are the seven spirit of God. The sevenfold Holy Spirit, who have been sent on duty far and wide into all the earth. Verse 7 And he came and took the book out of the hand of him who sat on the throne. And he went and took the book, access. The access that the angel does not have. The access that all the prophets and all the great men on earth did not have. The access that all principalities does not have. The access that all the demons of the oceans and all the best of the earth do not have. He has it. Oh, what a wonderful day. No wonder in verse 8 we were told. He, and when he had taken the straw, the four living creatures and the twenty-four elders of the heavenly Sahedrin prostrate themselves before the Lamb, each holding a harp, lutes and jetar, and they have golden bowl full of incense, fragments and gums of burning, with the prayers of the people of God. <laughs> And they sang a new song, saying, Thou art worthy. Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seal thereof. For thou was slain <laughs> and has redeemed us to God by thy blood. Out of what every kindred, tongues, people, and nation. Therefore, who are the elders? They were part of the redeemed. They were redeemed from the earth. Just like we Christians were redeemed from the earth. So they were part of the saints. And that's why the Bible says here, Thou was slain and has redeemed us to our God by thy blood of Christ. That means Christ died for them. So they were not of the Old Testament prophets. They were not taken from the foundation of uh, they were not angels either. They were part of the church. And they were taken from people, from nations, from tongues of the earth. They were not from the house of David. Then and has made us unto our God, King and Prince. And we know where that comment comes from, from the saints. 
So these elders were part of the saints. They were made kings and princes, and they shall reign with Christ on earth. And you shall make them a kingdom, royal race, princes to our God, and they shall reign as king over the earth, not heaven. So beside in verse 11, verse 10, he said, in verse 11, he make us clearer that I beheld and I heard a voice of many angels upon the throne and the beasts and the elders. And the number of them was as was ten thousand tens times ten thousand and thousands of thousands uncountable. And let's assume each angel represents the stars in the galaxies. That means they were unnumbered. So that is what John specified. Saying that with a loud voice, worthy is the Lamb that was slain to receive power, riches, wisdom, strength, honor, glory, and blessing. He was slain. How did he assess it? Because of he was slain. And in verse 13, every, I heard every creature, every created thing in heaven and on earth and under the earth in hate, in the place of the departed spirit and the, on the sea and all that are in it, crying unto, crying out together to him who sit on the throne and to the Lamb be, be ascribed the blessing, honor, the majesty, glory, splendor, and power, might, dominion forever and ever through eternity of the eternities. Amen. So, here's where we're going to end our teachings for today. Before we end our teachings, we want you to understand that Christ was willing to open the book and to lose the seventh seal. That he said, I wept much because no man was worthy. But Christ, the lion of the tribe of Judah and the conquering root of David, has what prevailed to open the seal and to lose the seven seal that are on it. Brethren, this is where we end. Before we pray, let us just use the opportunity to reflect upon this. This word was not given to make men fall. It was not given to make you see the terror of the judgment. This word was given to save life. We have tried our best to be able to cover some parts of this teaching. And we pray that the Holy Spirit will grant you understanding to understand the remaining parts of this teaching. Let us pray. Father, Lord, we thank you for your word that has come. We thank you for the understanding you've given to this church. We thank you for the wisdom to understand what you teach. Lord, whatever is left, we also commit it to your hands. We ask that your wisdom be multiplied upon the church. That understanding be granted unto them. This we ask through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Brethren, before we round up, if you miss any part of this episode, you want to follow up on the book of Revelation or the letter to the churches, you can go to cgfnslogin.app. cgfnslogin.app. And you log into our website, you can get most of the messages. On Tuesday, tonight, for most of you that are watching, is our online teaching where we normally pray with you and take your prayer request. It's known as Tarot Night. The time is between 11, between 11, 30 to 12.30 in the night. And this time is just one hour with the Lord in prayer. So if you are interested, you can tune in, write us your prayer request. We'll use it while praying for you. God bless you as you participate. Amen.